Well, I am just delighted to uh, have as our speaker today Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos. And uh, Tony, I, I don't get mad at me when I'm going to say this, but I'm probably not your best customer in that I am, own three pairs of shoes. Uh, the, the ones I'm wearing, uh, uh, some tennis shoes and some loafers. But about a year ago, when people started saying, you've you got to have this guy, Tony Shea, speak at one of your events, I went up to my wife and I said, look, do you, do you know this Tony Shea guy? Do you know Zappos? And she looked at me like <laughs> I would look at her if she said, do you know this Kobe Bryant and the Lakers? <laughs> And she pointed down, and I looked down, and there was a box, a white box with Zappos across the front. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my education about this amazing company and this amazing executive. Uh, as you all know, this is the place where you can go online, find the perfect pair of shoes, and 11 o'clock at night, order them, and get home the next day, and they're on your doorstep. It is an amazing company, and as you will hear, Tony is not your typical CEO. In 1999, at the age of 24, he sold Link Exchange, the company he co-founded, to Microsoft for $265 million. He then signed on and is an advisor and investor to this struggling company called Zappos, and eventually became its CEO. He's helped it grow from almost no sales to over $1 billion in gross merchandise sales annually. And as you probably read, about 10 months ago, uh, it was acquired by Amazon in a deal valued about $1.2 million. And, excuse me, billion, thank you. <laughs> a million just isn't what it used to be. But most important in that deal, as you know, is, is, is Tony secured an agreement that Amazon would let Zappos continue to, be, to do its own thing. And like what? Well, like empowering employees to be unconventional, to go above and beyond what's expected. And you've probably heard some of the stories. You'll hear more of them today. Uh, this philosophy has landed Zappos on Fortune Magazine's Best Companies to Work For list. And one reason for the success of Zappos is the emotional connection that this company has with its customers. And that is what Tony's new book is about, Delivering Happiness, a Path of Profits, Passion, and Purpose that he's going to be speaking about today. We're delighted to have him. Please welcome Tony Shea. So I wanted to do a quick survey first. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you had, well, first heard of Zappos prior to, prior to this? And how many of you have actually shopped with us before? OK. So the, normally when I do the survey, the ratio is about 2 to 1, women to men. And a lot of the men I ask, actually, it, it's the exact same story. They, they themselves have not personally shopped from us, but their wife or significant others have. And sometimes they're shopping for them. And I was giving a uh, tour on a couple years ago to an executive from one of the major record labels uh, here in LA. And I asked him the exact same question. And, and by the way, I'll give information later on. We're headquartered out of Las Vegas. And we give tours to the public Monday through Thursdays. And it's a lot of fun. We'll uh, pick you up from the airport in the Zappos shuttle, give you a tour for an hour, and then, uh, and then drop you off at your hotel afterwards. So. Uh, is it's it's actually it's it's a fun time and, and I'll give all the information for how to how to sign up. But uh, we were I, I so I happened to be giving a tour a couple of years ago to an executive from a, one of the major record labels, and I asked him the same question: Had he shopped with us before? And we were walking through the ground floor, which is where our merchandising department was, and he was explaining, no, he himself hadn't, but he suspected his wife had because these white Zappos boxes would show up at his doorstep. But then they disappear, and he had no idea what was going on. Was she buying them, exchanging them, returning them? And every time he asked her, he refu she refused to answer him and, and tell him what was going on. And so anyways, we went upstairs to our customer loyalty team, which is our name for our call center. And as, we were, as I was walking down and going over the history of Zappos and our philosophy about customer service, he sat down next to one of our call center reps and forced her to pull up his wife's account. <laughs> and, and he discovered that she had spent over $62,000 in her lifetime. So 
hopefully we weren't instrumental to any divorce proceedings. <laughs> So anyways, before getting to Zappos, I want to talk about what led me to Zappos. And the story actually begins with pizza. Uh, this was back in college. I, I went to college back east and 19, graduated in 95. And I was running a pizza business on the ground floor of our dorm. We probably had about three or 400 students in our dorm. And my roommate and I, we invested in the pizza ovens. We hired the employees. We dealt with the suppliers. And occasionally, I was making the pizzas myself. And this guy named Alfred, who's actually our CFO or chief financial officer today at, at Zappos, this is actually how we met. He would stop by every night and order a large pepperoni pizza for me. And it wasn't actually that weird because I had heard, I knew about Alfred's reputation, he, that he really enjoyed eating food. And in fact, I had experienced uh, a lot of times there'd be 10 of us late night at a Chinese restaurant somewhere and he would literally finish everyone's leftovers. And he actually continues to do that to, the, to this day. <laughs> and, uh, and so we had nicknames for him like uh, Monster or Human Trash Compactor and, and so on. So not that weird, but then sometimes he'd come by a few hours later and order another large pepperoni pizza from me. And I was just thinking to myself, wow, this boy can really eat. <laughs> well, I found out several years later, he was taking the pizzas upstairs and selling them off by the slice. So. <laughs> That's why he's our chief financial officer today <laughs> at Zappos. So after the pizza business, uh, Sanjay is my partner in it. He and I got together, formed an internet advertising company uh, called Link Exchange. And we grew that to about 100 or so people, and then ended up selling the company to Microsoft two and a half years later. But what a lot of people don't know is the reason why we ended up selling the company. And the real reason we ended up selling the company was because the company culture just went completely downhill, and it just wasn't a fun place to work at anymore. And I remember this was during the first dot-com boom when it was just five or 10 of us. It was your typical dot-com. It was a lot of fun. We were working around the clock, sleeping under our desks, had no idea what day of the week it was, uh, trying to remind ourselves to shower occasionally. But it was a lot, a lot of fun. And as we were growing, we started hiring our friends and friends of friends. And I remember one of uh, friends I had was on a cross-country tr vacation trip and we needed help and so he started helping out and actually never made his way back home. And we and that worked great we, until we got to about 15 or 20 people and then we had a big problem once we got to about 20 people and the problem was that we ran out of friends. And so we started hiring people that had all the right skill sets and experiences but weren't necessarily great for the company culture. And by the time we got to 100 people, I myself dreaded getting out of bed in the morning to go to the office. And that was kind of a strange feeling, because this was a company I had co-founded. And I was thinking to myself, if I felt this way, you know, how, much, how, how must all the other employees feel? So that's what really drove us to sell the company to Microsoft. And then both Sanjay and I ended up leaving, the com leaving Microsoft shortly thereafter. So afterwards, I was trying to figure out, OK, what do I want to do with my life now, now that I'm no longer involved with Link Exchange? And Alf and I got together and decided, OK, let's form an investment fund. And we ended up investing about 20 or so different internet companies. And Zappos just happened to be one of them. But over the course of that year, I realized that for me, investing was really boring. I felt like I was uh, sitting on the sidelines. And I really missed being part of building something. And so. Within a year, I ended up joining Zappos full time, and I've been with Zappos ever since. Uh, many of you have heard about a year ago, uh, Amazon announced that they were acquiring Zappos. And as was mentioned earlier, this was actually very different from most of the acquisitions that Amazon has done. In most of the acquisitions they've done, the plan is to fold the company and integrate it into the parent company. And eventually, the original company loses its identity. But for us, as a precondition for even considering the deal, we told them that we would only consider it consider it if Amazon allowed us to remain independent and we can continue growing the Zappos brand, culture, and our way of doing business our way. And I'm happy to report that they've remained true to their word. And basically, from our point of view, it's as if we swapped out our board of directors for a new one. So instead of flying to uh, San Francisco once a quarter for a board meeting, we fly to Seattle once a quarter now. So most people, when they hear about Zappos, think of us as an online retailer of shoes because that's how we started. Uh, we actually sell a lot more than shoes today. We sell clothing, uh, handbags, uh, kitchenware, housewares, and, and, and so on. And our hope is that 10 years from now, people won't even realize we started out selling shoes online. And our goal is just to build the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. 
And, uh, and actually, it doesn't even have to be limited to just even e-commerce. We, we've had customers email us and ask us if we would please start an airline or run the IRS. And you know, <laughs> we're not going to do either of those things this year. Um, but 20 or 30 years from now, I wouldn't rule out a Zappos Airlines. That's just about the very best customer service and customer experience. So one brand we look to for inspiration sometimes is Virgin, because they're in a whole bunch of different industries. They do uh, music, airlines, and so on. The difference is the Virgin brand is more about being hip and cool, whereas we just want to be about the very best customer service. And internally, we even have a saying that we're a service company that just happens to sell shoes and clothes and, and other product categories just now. And our whole philosophy is, let's take most of the money that we would have spent on paid advertising or paid marketing and instead invest it into the customer experience and customer service and let our customers do the marketing for us through word of mouth. And over the years, uh, we grew from basically no sales in 1999 to in 2008 was when we first hit a billion dollars in gross merchandise sales. And we've actually, despite the down economy, continued to grow. In our Q1 net sales this year were up almost 50% year over year. And the number one driver of all that growth has been through repeat customers and word of mouth. On any given day, about 75% of our orders are from repeat customers. And it's really, you know, people ask, what do we do differently over the past 24 months in a, in a bad economy? And it's not what we did in the past 24 months. It's what we did in the years prior to that to really gain our customers' loyalty and have them continue to shop with us even despite the economy. So these are some of the questions we ask ourselves when we think about how do we exceed our customers' ac expectations? And actually, the word we use internally is wow, but we use it as a verb. How do we wow our customers? And we also try to apply that same philosophy to thinking about how do we wow our employees and how do we wow our vendors? And we really think about what customers expect and then what they actually end up experiencing and trying to dif have that differential really create that, this emotional response in our customers. So it starts with the policies you see on our website. We offer free shipping both ways, so a lot of customers will order 10 different pairs of shoes and try them on in the comfort of their living room with 10 different outfits and then send back the ones that they don't like or don't fit in. We encourage that type of behavior. We also have a 365-day return policy for people that, I guess, have trouble committing or making up their minds. <laughs> and, um, and then you know, our contact information, most websites, it's very hard to find contact information. Usually. You know, it's maybe an email address that you can only email, one, email once and it's buried five links deep. Well, we take the exact opposite approach. We put our 1-800 number at the top of every single page of our website because we actually want to talk to our customers. And it's kind of funny because sometimes a lot of times I'll be speaking at a branding or advertising conference and there's a lot of discussion about consumers being bombarded with thousands and thousands of marketing messages every day and how to get your message to stand out, how to get your brand to stand out. And as kind of low tech and unsexy as it may sound, uh, and you never read about this in the press because it's not news, that our belief is that the telephone is one of the best branding devices out there. Because you have the customer's undivided attention for five to seven minutes, and what we found is if you get the interaction right, they remember it for a very long time and tell their friends and family about us. And it may seem strange because we're an internet company and 95% of our orders come in through the internet. Only 5% of orders are placed through the telephone. Why do we focus so much on the telephone? And the answer is because we found that on average, every customer actually calls us about once, at least once, sometime during their lifetime. And we just have to make sure we get that interaction right. And in fact, most of our phone calls do not result in sales during that actual phone call. It might be the customer's first time going through the returns process and they just want a little help printing out that free return label. Or maybe they're going to a wedding this weekend and they want some fashion advice. And I think we have some customers that call us because they're lonely sometimes. And <laughs> we'll, um, we'll talk to them as well. Uh, and, and we run our call center very differently from most call centers. We don't have scripts. We don't try to upsell. Uh, we don't measure this. Uh, most call centers have this concept called average handle time, which is all about efficiency of the call center. How many customers can each rep talk to in a day? which translates into how quickly can you get the customer off the phone. And for us, we don't, we don't uh, track that. In, in fact, our, we found out that our longest phone call, we had a new record set about a month ago, was seven and a half hours long. <laughs> so not sure how the bathroom situation works out for that. But, but, it, but our whole philosophy is actually, you know, without scripts and without trying to view uh, 
the, the call center through an efficiency lens and without trying to view it through a revenue lens. Instead, let's view it through a branding lens and really think about how do we brand ourselves to be about the very best customer service one phone call at a time. And so if you call and you're looking for a pair of shoes and if we're out of stock of your specific size, everyone's trained to look on at least three other competitor websites. If they find it there, direct you to the competitor. And obviously we're gonna lose that sale, uh, but we're not trying to maximize every single transaction. We're trying to maximize the customer experience. Our warehouse, we also run 24 seven, which actually is not the most efficient way to run a warehouse. The most efficient way is to let the orders pile up and then uh, once they've piled up enough, then the picker in the warehouse doesn't have to walk as far, there's higher picking density, and then that increases the efficiency of the warehouse. But we're not trying to maximize for efficiency, we're trying to maximize for the customer experience. And because our warehouse is located in Kentucky, 15 minutes away from the UPS hub there, and because we run our warehouse 24 seven, and because we do a lot of surprise upgrades to overnight shipping for a lot of our loyal repeat customers, a lot of customers will order as late as midnight Eastern time and their order, their shoes show up on their doorstep eight hours later and they're expecting it a week later and that creates that whole wow response that they remember for a very long time and tell their friends and family about. So for all this focus on customer service and building our brand to be about the very best customer service, the number one priority of the company is actually not customer service. Our number one priority is company culture. And our whole belief is that if we get the culture right, then most of the other stuff like delivering great customer service or building a long-term enduring brand or business will just happen naturally on its own. So we do a lot of things on the customer service side. It starts with the hiring process. We do two sets of interviews. They're separate sets of interviews. Uh, the first set for everyone that's hired, uh, the first set is kind of the standard stuff. The hiring manager and his or her team will interview for fit within the team, relevant experience, technical ability, and so on. But then our HR department does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit. And they have to pass both in order to be hired. So we've passed on a lot of really smart, talented people that we know can make an immediate impact on our top or bottom line. But if they're not good for our culture, we won't hire them. It's not even a question. And the reverse is true too. Even if someone is doing their specific job function perfectly fine, or even if they're a superstar in their job function, if they're bad for the culture, that's something that we will fire them for and our performance reviews are 50% based on whether you're living or inspiring the Zappos culture in others. The other thing we do is everyone that's hired in our headquarters in Las Vegas, doesn't matter what position, you can be an accountant, lawyer, software developer, you go through the exact same training as our call center reps. And one of the weeks is later on, we'll send you to Kentucky where you do all the different warehouse functions, picking, packing, shipping, receiving, and so on. But the first four weeks, before you start the actual job you were hired for, we go over company, it's, it's four weeks, it's, we'll go over company history, the importance of company culture, our philosophy about customer service, and then you're actually on the phone for two weeks taking calls from customers. And the reason why we have everyone in the company go through this is because if we're serious about building our brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience, then customer service shouldn't just be a department. It should be the entire company. And the other great thing about it is during, during our busy Q4 holiday season, People from all different departments can and do hop on the phones to help, take, to help us handle the load. And that not only makes sure that we're delivering the very best customer service, which we may not get if we hire temps, but it also protects our culture because we don't have uh, people from other companies coming in and, and, that, and having a negative effect on our culture. The other thing we do during the training is at the end of the first week of training, we make an offer to everyone in the class. And the offer is this. We will pay you for the time you've already spent training, plus a bonus of $2,000 to quit and leave the company right now. And that's actually a standing off until the end of training, and then we extend it a couple months beyond that and raise it to $3,000. And when we first started this a few years ago, uh, it actually was at $100. And every year on average, we find that about two or 3% of people end up taking the offer. And so we actually keep upping the offer because we feel like not enough people are, are taking it. And, and, and our original thought was, okay, this would be a good way to weed out the people that are here just for a paycheck. Because in Las Vegas, starting pay for a call center rep is $11 an hour. There's plenty of other call centers in Las Vegas. And we want people that really want to be a part of the company, really believe in our long-term vision, and really feel like this is the culture that's right for them. Well, what surprised us actually was as we were doing this, the biggest benefit was 
actually not what we thought it would be. Because we thought, okay, this will just help save us a lot of heartache and, and money in the long run from the people that need to leave. But we found the biggest benefit was from the people that didn't take the offer. Because they still had to go home and talk to their friends and family over the weekend and ask themselves, is this a company that I really believe in? And is this a company whose culture I really want to be a part of and contribute to? And when they decide not to take, that, take the offer, not to uh, take the easy money, what we found is back in the office on Monday, they're that much more engaged and committed and passionate about the company. And by far, that's been uh, both the biggest surprise and biggest benefit from our $2,000 offer. The other thing we do is we have something which uh, I'll give information later on to. Be, we're happy to send you out a copy for free. We have something called a culture book. And it's something that we put out once a year. And we ask all our employees to write a few paragraphs about what the Zappos culture means to them. And except for typos, it's unedited. So it includes the good and the bad. And it's organized by department. So you can see how the accounting culture might be slightly different from the warehouse culture. And it's kind of like when you're on Amazon and you're reading uh, customer reviews of a product. These are basically employee reviews of the company. And uh, I'll make that freely available later on. The other thing that is that we're very active on Twitter. In fact, we train every employee how to use Twitter during their first four weeks. And then it's up to them after that four weeks to decide whether they actually want to continue using it or not. Uh, out of our, we have about a little over 2,000 employees now. About 500 are active on Twitter. And if you go to twitter.zappos.com, there's actually, you can see the 500 employees that are active there. And then we also have a page where we aggregate all of their tweets together. And that, we found that's been really helpful for helping uh, build our culture because you may not talk to that other employee that's three aisles down from you except for saying hi as you're passing in the hallway. But maybe through Twitter, you found out that he went hiking over the weekend. And if you're also an avid hiker, now you have something to talk about when you pass each other in the, in the hallways. And then what we found is actually sometimes that results in them going hiking the next weekend together. So Twitter's been great for building our culture. In terms of how we're thinking of building our brand over the next several years, we internally refer to as the three Cs, clothing, customer service, and company culture. And for us, this is really the life cycle of the customer. So for customers that have never heard of Zappos before, have no idea what we do, we want them to know that we've got a great selection of clothing and footwear and other product categories. Once they know that we have a great selection of that, then we want them to know that we're all about delivering the very best customer service and customer experience. And that's not something that we tell them so much as something that they experience when they get that surprise upgrade to overnight shipping, or they see how easy it is to exchange or return a product, or they call our 1-800 number. And once they know that we're all about the very best customer service, then we want them to know about our culture and our core values, which is essentially a formalized definition of our culture, because that's really the platform that makes all of that possible. So we've actually had customers email us and tell us when they get that perfect outfit or perfect pair of shoes, that Zappos is happiness in a box. So whether it's the happiness that customers feel from getting that perfect outfit or perfect pair of shoes, or the happiness that customers feel by experiencing great customer service, or the happiness that employees feel by being part of a culture where the company's core values match their own personal values, what we realized was the thing that ties all of these things together is that Zappos is really just about delivering happiness, whether it's to customers or employees. And we try to apply that same philosophy to our vendors as well. So when you come on a tour in, in our office in Las Vegas, the first thing you'll see when you enter the reception area is what we refer to as the Zappos library. But it's not a normal lending library. It's a giving library. And one of our core values is to pursue growth and learning. And so we have about 30 or 40 titles in the Zappos library. That, and we make all the books freely available to not only our employees, but to visitors as well. So a lot of visitors, after their tour, will walk away with a handful of books. And uh, we're happy to uh, be a part of that. But two of the books I wanted to talk about that we really believe in a lot at, at Zappos, in fact, to the point where we actually even teach classes on these two books to our employees, are Good to Great by Jim Collins and Tribal Leadership. And Tribal Leadership, in fact, we partnered with the authors. And the audio version of that book is available for download for free from the Zappos website. But the reason why I found both of these books really interesting and, and really applicable to Zappos is because the authors researched and looked at what separated the great companies in terms of long-term financial performance from just the good ones or mediocre ones. And they were actually surprised by their findings. It wasn't at all what they expected. And they found that the great companies had two important ingredients that the good companies or mediocre ones generally did not. 
And the first ingredient was that the great companies all had very strong cultures. And for us, we formalized the definition of our culture into 10 core values. Now, the difference is you know, a lot of companies have, uh, they might call them core values or guiding principles or so on. But the problem is usually they're very lofty sounding and they kind of read like a press release the marketing department put out. Uh, maybe you learn about it on day one of orientation and uh, they sound um, like all their competitors. And, uh, but then it just becomes this meaningless plaque on the lobby wall that none of the employees pay attention to. And for us, we wanted to come up with committable core values. And by committable, we mean we're willing to hire or fire people based on whether they're living up to those values completely independent of their specific job performance. And when you use that criteria, it's actually a pretty hard list to come up with. So we didn't do the standard thing where a bunch of senior executives went to an offsite for a long weekend and came up with uh, you know, something that, that sounded uh, lofty and, and, and good. Instead, about five years ago, I sent an email out to the entire company and asked everyone what should our core values be and got a whole bunch of different responses back. And we went back and forth for about a year and then eventually came up with these are our 10 core values, which you can, uh, if you do a Google search for Zappos core values, uh, you'll, you'll see this as well. Actually, the other thing that I, I really like about the list of core values we ended up coming up with is that they're all pretty much unique to Zappos. And if you do a Google search for any single one of those core values, for almost all of them, Zappos will be the number one search result. Whereas for most other companies, if you do a Google search for any single one of their core values, page after page after page, the company is nowhere to be seen. So for us, we actually have interview questions for each and every one of these core values. And the one that probably trips us up the most during the hiring process is the last one, be humble, because there's a lot of really smart, talented people out there that are also egotistical. And for us, it's just not even a question. We just won't hire them. Whereas at a lot of other companies, the conversation afterwards, when if you're interviewing someone like that, might be, well, this person might be kind of annoying and rub you the wrong way, but he's going to add a lot of value to the company. Therefore, we should hire this person. And that one hire may or may not bring the company culture downhill, but I think if you keep making compromises like that over and over and over again, I think that's why most large companies don't have great company cultures. Incidentally, this is probably the one that's hardest to actually come up with an interview question for because you can't say, how humble are you? And then they say, I'm the most humble person in the whole wide world. Um, <laughs> but one of the ways we test for this is, um, so a lot of our candidates are from out of town as well. And we'll do the same thing we do for anyone. Uh, we'll pick them up from the airport in Zappa shuttle, give them the hour long tour, and then afterwards they'll spend the day interviewing. Well, at the end of the day of interviews, the recruiter will actually circle back to the shuttle driver and ask how they were treated. And it doesn't matter how well the day of interviews went. If the shuttle driver wasn't treated well, we just won't hire that person. And so for, uh, I'll give some examples of other interview questions that we, that we asked. So the third one, create fun and a little weirdness. One of our interview questions is actually, on a scale one to 10, how weird are you? <laughs> and if you answer a one, you're probably a little bit too straight-laced for the Zappos culture. Uh, if you answer a 10, you might be too psychotic for us. Uh, but uh, it's actually not so much the number that we care about. It's seeing how they respond. Because our belief is that everyone's a little weird somehow. And this is more just a fun way of saying that we really recognize and celebrate each person's individuality. And we want their true personalities to come out when they're at work in the, in the office, in, in the workplace, whether it's with each other as employees or with customers or in dealing with our vendors. Because you know, there's so many people in corporate America where they're a different person at home on weekends versus when they go into the office on Monday. And they leave a little part of themselves, or in a lot of cases, a big part of themselves at, at home when, whenever they go into the office. And, for, and that results in a lot of discussion about work-life separation or work-life balance. And what we really strive for at Zappos is, rather than work-life separation, we strive for work-life integration. And we want you to be the same person, whether you're at home on the weekends or in the office. And we really strive to create an office environment where people are just comfortable being themselves. Because what we found is that's when, when people are comfortable being themselves, that's when the true friendships form, not just coworker relationships. And that's when uh, the great ideas come out. And that's when people are the most creative. And so that's why we have Create Fun and a Little Weirdness as one of our core values. 
And as an example, going back to us not using scripts for our telephone, uh, if you call once, you might get someone that, say, is, likes, is great at telling jokes, is making you laugh, and that's great. We, we don't prescribe, oh, you have to tell customers jokes, but if that's your personality and matches the customer's personality, great. And then you might call a second time and get someone that's not a joke teller, but if, uh, say, he hears your dog barking in the background, and if you also have a dog, or if, or if the rep also has a dog, then the two of you can bond over dogness or whatever dog, dog owners talk about. And then, uh, or you, you might call in, maybe you get someone that's from the same home, or you, from the same hometown, and then the two of you can talk about that. And really, for us, it's all about trying to create that personal emotional connection and, and encouraging people to be themselves. Uh, number four, be adventurous, creative, and open-minded. One of our interview questions for this is, on a scale one to 10, how lucky are you in life? One is, I don't know why bad things always seem to happen to me. 10 is, I don't know why good things always seem to happen to me. Well, we don't want to hire the ones because they're bad luck, and we don't want bad luck to come <laughs> to Zappos. That wouldn't be good for us. Uh, but this was actually inspired by a research study I'd read about a few years ago where they actually asked that exact same question to a random group of people. So they got answers all over the board, some ones, some tens, a whole bunch in between. And then afterwards, they had them do a task. And the task was to go through a newspaper and count the number of photos that were in that newspaper. But what the participants didn't know was that it was actually a fake newspaper. And sprinkled throughout the newspaper were these headlines that would say things like, if you're reading this now, you can stop the answers 37 and plus tell the researcher you saw this headline and collect an extra $100. <laughs> and what they found was that the people that considered themselves unlucky in life generally never noticed the headlines. They just went through the task at hand and you know, eventually came up with the right answer, whereas the people that considered themselves lucky in life generally stopped early and made the extra $100. So, the takeaway is that it's not so much that people are inherently lucky or unlucky in life, but luck is really more about being open to opportunity beyond just how the task or situation presents itself. And so that's why we asked that question for core value number four. One of our other core values is about building open and honest relationships. Uh, that really uh, is just all about transparency, and we apply that to our customers, to our employees, and to our vendors as well. So for our customers, for example, we host a, we hold a quarterly all hands meeting for our employees, and we actually live stream that onto the internet for any, anyone can tune in if, if they'd like, uh, but actually whether you're a customer or not. And when we have reporters from, whether it's for TV or for a magazine and so on, when they come to our offices uh, and want to do a story, we approach it very differently from most large corporations. In most large corporations, the, the reporter would probably be escorted around by the PR person, and the PR person would say, you can talk to that VP over there and that person in communications over there. Everyone else is off limits. Don't talk to anyone else. Whereas what we do is we'll give them a tour, and then at the end of the tour, we say, bathroom is over there, lunchroom is over there. Walk around, talk to whoever you want, and then come find me when you're done. And we, you know, the reporter, say, ends up talking to 10 random people, and they're not, you know, the employees aren't going to, they haven't been media trained in the traditional sense, and uh, they're not going to use the same sound bites or words. But what the reporter will find is consistency in their thoughts and values, and most importantly, uh, in their authenticity. And the reason we're comfortable doing that is because we know we've hired employees whose personal core values match the corporate core values. And we know that every employee understands the long-term vision of the company because we, they go through that four weeks of initial training. And so every employee is just automatically living the brand. And so that's why we're comfortable with employees, with reporters just walking around and asking whoever they want, whatever they want. Uh, for employees, we have a monthly newsletter called Ask Anything, where it's literally that. Employees can ask about financials or what brands we're gonna carry and so on. And we'll get the best person at Zappos to answer that, and then we'll compile all the answers together in a monthly newsletter, and we send that out to all the employees. For our vendors, we work with about 1,500 different brands, and we actually have this thing called an extranet where they can log into our backend systems and view the exact same information our own buyers and merchandisers can see. So they can view on-hand inventory, sales, inventory turn, markdowns, profitability, and so on. And when we first rolled this out, I remember the reaction from the vendor community 
was, wow, this is great, because normally the retail, retailer, wholesaler relationships, relationships are a little adversarial. And they said, love this, uh, you know, not, not, not gonna, how can we get more of this? But just one question, aren't you worried this information is gonna get into the hands of competitors? And realistically, I'm sure some of the information does eventually find its way into the hands of competitors. But on the flip side, we now have an extra 1,500 pairs of eyes helping us co-manage our business, and they're not on our payroll. And a lot of times, they actually notice stuff that our own buyers and merchandisers might miss because they're so busy, and, and whereas each brand is just focused on their one brand, and they get these nightly sales reports, and they're logging in several times a day. So for us, we found that the benefits far outweigh any perceived risk. So one common reaction we get a lot of times after people tour our offices, and they say, okay, I get it. Uh, happy for you, Zappos, you've got this great culture, but this would never work at my company. And what I found really interesting about the research from Good to Great and Tribal Leadership was that what they found was that it actually doesn't matter what your core values are. What matters that is that you have them and that you commit to them. And the power comes from the alignment that you get from everyone having the same values and, and understanding the values of the of the corporation and, and actually practicing those values, not just stating them and putting them on a lobby wall. And I found, I found that really interesting. So I'm not up here trying to say anyone here or other companies should be adopting the Zappos core values, because in most cases that would probably be the wrong decision. But what I am saying is that you should have core values that you actually commit to. And by committing to, meaning you're willing to hire or fire based on whether employees are living up to those core values, independent of their actual job performance. Again, when you use that criteria, it's actually a pretty hard list to come up with real core values. So I'm gonna make this presentation available, but the reason why I actually included, wanted to include some of these other stories in here is because a common reaction we get sometimes is, okay, Zappos, I, I get it. Uh, you guys made the Fortune 100 best company to work for list, but you know, it's because you're an internet company and special rules apply to internet companies. And one of the th other ways that we're transparent and, and really embrace this whole transparency thing is we actually have a separate website called zapposinsights.com where it, it actually has evolved over the years, but it started out as a monthly video subscription service where uh, other businesses can just ask whatever question they want, like for example, what are our interview questions and how do we evaluate them? And then we'll get our head of recruiting to answer on video and, and we make that information all freely available to all the subscribers. But then that's evolved into we now host these one-day and two-day seminars where people from all over the world actually fly in and we help them figure out their own core values that are right for their company and build, to build their own strong cultures. And one of the companies that came in about a year ago was this company called the Lanta Refrigeration Company. And that's one of the stories in there where they came in and uh, really helped fi figure out which core values they wanted to stand for and then went back and really focused on delivering better customer service to make their customers happier, and then focused on company culture to make their employees happier. And then they sent us these before and after pictures of their offices to show the transformation in a relatively short period of time, it was, I think two or three months. And now they're reporting that their customers are happier, their employees are happier, and their revenues and profits are up, uh, even though they're in a down economy and you know, doing refrigeration repairs out in the field in Atlanta, and, and you know, in some ways that you can't think of a more opposite company or industry than Zappos. So it's really neat seeing this type of uh, essentially using happiness as a business model work in other companies and industries. So going back to good to great and tribal leadership, talked about how there were two important ingredients that the researchers found that separated the great companies in terms of long-term financial performance from just the good ones. And the first one was the great companies all have strong cultures, and the second one I actually find even more surprising, and, and the researchers were surprised by it as well, in terms of what were the ingredients that the great companies had. And the second in important ingredient was that the great companies all had a vision that had a greater purpose beyond just money or profits or being number one in a market. And the irony there is that by actually have, having a higher purpose that's not just about profits, it actually enabled these companies to make more profits in the long run. So a lot of times, if I'm speaking at an entrepreneur conference, I might get asked afterwards by someone that's thinking of starting a business and they say, what's a good market to go into where I can make a lot of money? And my advice to them is always, don't let money be your primary motivator. Instead, think about what you would be so passionate about doing 
that you'd be happy doing it for 10 years, even if you never made a dime. And that's what you should be doing. Because if you do that, your chances of actually making more money will, are actually uh, greatly increased because your passion is going to rub off onto your employees and your passion is going to translate into customers really uh, being more loyal. And uh, it's going to translate into your vendors and business suppliers wanting to do business with you more when you're not being driven purely by the money. So I like to say, chase the vision, not the money. Uh, there was a movie that came out a few years ago called Notorious. And uh, I, I think it lasted a week in the theater. And I may have been the only one that saw it. But in it, Puff Daddy, uh, rapper Puff Daddy, says to Notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Smalls, don't chase the paper, chase the dream. I just want an excuse to put this picture up at the Milken <laughs> Institute. So. <laughs> so if you're an entrepreneur, you know, I would think about what would you be so passionate about doing that you'd be happy doing it for 10 years, even if you never made a dime? And that's what you should be doing. And if you have employees that report to you, think about what's the larger vision and greater purpose in your employees' work beyond just money or profits or being number one in a market that you yourself are also passionate about. There's a lot of you know, books and consultants that talk about how to motivate employees. And you know, they work up to a certain extent. And you know, a lot of corporate America, and there's different ways to motivate employees. A lot of corporate America motivates employees through fear. Uh, you can also motivate employees through incentives. Uh, you can motivate employees through recognition. But what we found at Zappos is that there's a huge difference between motivation and inspiration. And if you can inspire your employees through a vision that has a greater purpose beyond just money or profits or being number one in the market, and if you can inspire your employees by having core values, actually practice core values, not just stated core values of the corporation that match their own personal values, then you can accomplish so much more. And you don't need to worry about the motivation part of it. So this is a timeline of how we evolved our brand and thinking over the years at Zappos. Uh, a lot of the stuff is stuff that we just accidentally stumbled into. And then we kind of saw what was working and what wasn't, and, and then eventually figured things out along the way. So in 1999, 11 years ago, when we first started, the vision was simply, let's just be the market leader in shoes and really build our brand to be about selection. And then four years into it, in 2003, we sat around and asked ourselves, what do we want to be when we grow up? Do we want to be about shoes, or do we want to be about something more meaningful? And that's when we decided, OK, let's build our brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. And that way, we're not limiting ourselves to just shoes anymore. And when we decided on that and then communicated this new vision to our employees, a funny thing happened that we didn't anticipate. We found that suddenly employees were a lot more engaged and passionate about the company. And when customers called, they could sense that the person on the other end of the phone wasn't there just for a paycheck, but truly wanted to provide great service. And then when vendors came and visited our offices, we found that they wanted to come and visit us more frequently and stay longer. And all of these things had this kind of multiplicative snowball effect that really drove a lot of our growth over the years. And then a couple years after that, we decided, OK, company culture has always been important because I didn't want to make the same mistake I had made at my previous company at Link Exchange. But instead of making it important, Let's actually make it the number one priority of the company with the belief that if we get the culture right, then the other stuff like delivering great customer service and building a long-term enduring brand will just happen naturally on its own. And that's when we rolled out our core values. And a couple years after that, we started thinking about, OK, there's lots of different ways to deliver great customer service. One way is to kind of go the high-tech approach, which is kind of the approach that Amazon uh, uh, approaches. It. You know, let's, it's all about efficiency and technology and using that to minimize customer interaction. Uh, for us, we decided, actually, let's do the, almost the complete opposite. Instead of high tech, let's go the high touch approach. And really, uh, in we came up with this acronym, PEC, which stands for Personal Emotional Connection. And let's really work on building personal emotional connections with our customers, one interaction at a time. And then a couple years after that, last year, we took a step back and realized, OK, so customer service is all about making customers happy. And company culture is all about making employees happy. 
let's just enlarge the Zappos vision and have the vision be just about delivering happiness, whether it's to customers or employees or vendors. And that's what led us to then launch the Zappos Insights program because rather than just keep this amongst ourselves and focus on us just making our employees and our customers happier, let's help teach other companies how to do this and essentially spread this idea of happiness as a business model. And, you know, and, and that's what led to ZapposInsights.com, which has nothing to do with selling shoes online. And so it's, for us, it's just been really interesting. And you know, we didn't have this grand master plan from the beginning. We just kind of slowly uh, stumbled in and over time grew our vision as we started seeing what was working and what wasn't working. So I wanted to tell another pizza story. And um, this actually happened a few years ago, uh, actually here in Santa Monica. Um, there was a Skechers sales conference going on. And uh, it had been a long day. And at the end of the day, a bunch of us decided to go bar hopping. And I had never been bar hopping in the Santa Monica area before. And, and so I think there were three people from Skechers, which is one of the brands that we worked with, and three people from Zappos. And so we went to the first bar. And someone ordered a round of drinks. And then someone else ordered a round of shots, because it had been a long day. So we finished the shots, and we finished the drinks. And then we went to the second bar, and someone else ordered a round of drinks to pay back for that first round of drinks. And then someone else ordered a second round of shots to pay back for that first round of shots. So we're looking at the shots, looking at the drinks, and just you know, conclude you can't waste alcohol. So <laughs> we took the shots, finished the drinks. And we went to the third bar. Yeah, and I actually don't know how many shots or drinks we had after that. But what I do know is that uh, in California, uh, I, I'm from Vegas, so in California, uh, last call is 2 a.m. And so we went to, must have been a few different bars, and then eventually you know, lights went on and uh, last call and they stopped serving. And so we started walking back to our hotel. And as we were walking back, one of the girls from Skechers asked if we wanted to order pepperoni pizza together. You know, we'll all share pepperoni pizza. And we're like, oh yeah, that sounds great. And she said, oh, and I'm so looking forward to this pepperoni pizza. Before we left, I saw it on the room service menu. It was on page 17, item number two. And I'm so excited about this pepperoni pizza. You have no idea how excited I am about it. And when it comes, I know it's going to be hot, and I don't want to burn the roof of my mouth. So I'm going to gently blow on it and let the <laughs> flavor waft in and, and just appreciate the aroma of the pepperoni pizza. And it was only a five minute walk back to the hotel, but it seemed much longer than that because she would not stop talking about this pepperoni pizza. Anyway, so we finally wind up in someone's hotel room and all, she's all excited and she calls room service. And then 10 seconds later, hangs up the phone all dejected. And I ask her, what's wrong? And apparently at this hotel, or maybe at Santa Monica in general, they don't serve hot food after 11 p.m. And by, by then, it was, I don't know, 3 a.m. or something. And she just looked really sad. And, uh, and she was like, oh, you have no idea how much I was craving this pepperoni pizza. And I look at her, and I'm like, I think we all have a pretty good idea of how much <laughs> you were craving this pepperoni. And, and, but then she was still really sad. So, so I offer up to her. I say, oh, did you know in college I used to make pepperoni pizza? And she looks at me, and she's like, that's so not helpful right now. <laughs> and then, so just you know, trying to brainstorm. And then Fred, who's uh, uh, from Zappos, he and I came up with the best idea. We, we said, oh, you know what you should do? You should call Zappos. Like, we'll all about, we're all about the best customer service. <laughs> and we'll take care of you. And, and it'll be great. And in our inebriated state of mind, that was the funniest thing ever. Um, <laughs> so. She actually took us up on our dare. So she, she puts it on speakerphone, calls Zappos, and the ref says, thanks for calling Zappos. How can I help you? He said, oh, thank goodness you answered. I'm in Santa Monica right now, and we've had a few drinks in us, uh, but I've been craving this item on the room service menu, page 17, item number two, pepperoni pizza. <laughs> I'm reading it right here. And you know, this hotel doesn't serve hot food after 11 PM. I mean, what kind of hotel doesn't serve hot food after 11 PM? Well, first, there was an awkward silence. <laughs> and then the ref said, you know you called Zappos, right? We, 
sell shoes, we sell clothes, um, but we don't sell pizza yet. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I heard you're all about the very best customer service. And so the rep said, okay, hold on. And put us on hold for two minutes, and then came back listing the five closest places in the Santa Monica area, area that were still open and delivering pizza at that hour. Now, I hesitate a little to tell the story because I don't want all, all of you to start calling Zappos and <laughs> ordering pizza from us. But I just think it's a fun story. I mean, clearly we don't have a process and procedure for late night drunk pizza orders. <laughs> but um, I, I just think it's a fun story to illustrate that if you get the culture right and make sure the employees understand the long-term vision of the company, then most of the other stuff like delivering great customer service or building your brand one phone call at a time just happens naturally on its own. And these types of stories, these types of interactions happen with us literally thousands and thousands of times every single day. And that's really how we've built our brand over the years. Uh, we're working on it. We're working on selling pizza. Uh, and so these are some of the other questions we ask ourselves. Where does the story begin from the customer's perspective and where does it end? Because too many co companies, or I guess e-commerce companies specifically, think the story ends once you've got the customer's credit card number. Whereas we focus most of our efforts and resources on what happens after we've gotten the, the customer's credit card number. And we think about what are the memories that we can create for our customers and what are the emotions that they'll experience. And uh, basically, we're in the stories and memories business. And then we think about our vision. How can we always think about making our vision bigger and bigger? And, and how can we think differently? And one of my favorite stories is about Cirque du Soleil that completely redefined the circus business. You know, prior to Cirque du Soleil, the way to have a better circus, if you were going to be a competitor in that industry, was to have bigger elephants or more elephants. And then Cirque du Soleil came along and just completely thought of a different way to approach the circuit business. So we're always thinking about, OK, how do we get people to tell more stories to their friends and family? How do we create an emotional connection with our customers? How do we have an emotional impact? And how do we think bigger as we continue to grow and, uh, and we'll basically listen to our customers and our employees and just keep an open mind and not think of ourselves as just a company that sells shoes online? So um, I'm going to, before I wrap up, uh, we have some time for some Q&A. And I think there's people with microphones running around. And so they'll run the mic to you. While they're running the mic, I uh, wanted to uh, actually give out two other website addresses. Uh, one is f uh, for the book. It's called De deliveringhappinessbook.com. And there, we're actually it, it, collecting stories from people that have read the book or uh, or heard some of the other stories. And, and it's actually really neat hearing how you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking specifically from a business perspective, we're starting to get stories from people that are, do, that are applying similar principles to stuff not related to businesses at all. We're hearing from uh, churches or from schools and from other organizations. So that's been really interesting and surprising for us. Uh, the other website I would uh, encourage you to check out is deliveringhappinessbus.com. We're actually right now in the middle of a three-month cross-country bus tour. We got a 50-foot bus, and there's 10 of us on the bus, and we're basically going around the country to 23 different cities. We just finished city number six, and uh, in every city we're doing something different. It's, it's, uh, there's two or three events a day, and we try to do something where we partner with the local charity, and then we also do something with that's local and special to that community. So in Times Square, for example, we had uh, 15, uh, they call them pedicabs, people on, on bicycles with uh, happy flags just going around Times Square in, in circles. And that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then in Iowa, we went to University of Iowa and spoke to students about really pursuing their passions instead of doing what their parents want them to do. And, uh, and it's been interesting getting feedback from the students that, uh, I mean, their parents might hate us, but we, um, but we actually heard back from someone that dropped out of pre-med after the talk and went to, um, uh, well, the student's happy. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just been a lot of fun. We've got, I think, 17 more cities to go. So um, I don't know who has the first question. Yeah. Actually, there are two things. I, I wanted to know what your profit margins look like. And the other thing which I'm so curious about is I'd love to hear you characterize your first meeting with Jeff Bezos. And... Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, in terms of profit margins, uh, I, I can talk about, I, it's a little tricky now because we're part of Amazon, which is a public company. So whereas prior to, one of the things that has changed because of the acquisition is exactly that. We can't, we used to just give out our financials very freely. Uh, but because we're part of a pu public company, we don't have as much freedom as before. But uh, very roughly, generally, I can let you know that the gross margins after shipping and so on is probably around between 30, 35% gross margins um, in terms of our net sales. Um, in terms of the first meeting with Jeff Bezos, it was actually pretty, uh, pretty interesting because actually went through a similar presentation and, and actually I have a few, few slides left, um, but as I was going through the slides, um, he, he actually said something, he, he made a statement and, and it, the slide hasn't come up yet, so, so I don't wanna give away what's on that slide, but he made a statement and then that was basically the next slide, so that was very s surreal and, and I think that, that helped. But Jeff Bezos, I actually don't have that much interaction with him uh, because it is literally once every three months we fly up for a two-hour meeting with you know ten people in the room, uh, but one of the um, I, I think he's always really liked the entrepreneurial spirit because that's he went through that and that's his background. But one of the th important things that we actually have laid out in terms of our the relationship between Amazon and Zappos, we actually have this document called the Five Tenets document, where it explicitly states that we're going to make our own decisions independently. And he's been very uh, good at enforcing that those five tenets. So there's been times when we've actually made the complete opposite decision that Amazon has made for the rest of Amazon. So so far, it's been a great relationship. Uh, oh, microphone. Uh, another Amazon qu uh, question: Why did they acquire your company? And what do they want to get out of it, given they kept some independent from you? Um, I think, uh, and this is, you know, I don't know all the inner workings of Amazon because we are being kept separate and independent, but my take on it, they actually did try to launch a competitor called Endless.com. Uh, oh, and actually, the first time I met, Zap, met uh, Bezos was uh, about, I think, 2004 or 2005 when he actually visited us briefly and wanted to buy Zappos then, and we said no, and that's when after, shortly thereafter they decided to launch Endless.com, which was a competitor. And uh, so my take on it was that they never quite got as good traction on Endless as, as Zappos, and you know, in terms of relative sales, that's definitely true. Uh, but I think the other reason is because Amazon is very good at uh, uh, the stuff I was talking about, like high tech automation and so on, which works great for books and electronics and that type of merchandise, hard, hard goods, but for uh, apparel and, and footwear, there's definitely a lot more of an art to running that business. And, and so one way we think about it is Amazon's really all about the science and we're about the art and there's a lot we can learn from each other. Yep. Tony, um, how much of an impact, if any, did your experience at Harvard have on your success and your philosophy? Um, I guess my take on college for, uh, for people that want to be entrepreneurs, my advice would be take the time and money that you would have spent on college and just start four different businesses and, <laughs> and, and you know, do one, do one new one each year and even if each one of them fails, you'll learn way more through that than going to undergrad <laughs> or business school. I want to thank you for sharing your, your concepts and um, your tactics for success because I think, you know, when you add value and you be of service and you create extraordinary results, you create that flow of energy that, that m puts you on momentum to success. My question is, however, as a board of directors for Boys Town, when are you coming to Orange County because we'd really like to be one of your uh, <laughs> nonprofits that you support? Uh, when, when is the company coming to Orange County? Or oh, the bus. Um, all, all the tour stops are, I don't know if, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to LA and San Diego, so is Orange County on the way? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we'll at least wave hi. Um, I don't know if Orange County is one of, one of the stops, but if you go to the bus website, uh, definitely you know, the schedule is, the calendar is always in flux, and if there's enough interest from Orange County, then we'll definitely consider it. I really like your open culture. 
And can you tell us an example or give us an example of one time when perhaps being so open worked against you and what you learned from that and uh, how you dealt with it? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting because it's actually hard to come up with a time. You know, there's so much fear about being open, but uh, in general, anytime we have been, uh, it's things have never turned out that that bad. But one of the things that I've always wanted to push for and uh, and could never get enough support for internally was actually making salaries and employee reviews public and, and open to. And so, uh, I guess kind of the uh, addendum to being open and honest is that you need, you need the right context for it. And so one of the challenges with that scenario is if you just say, oh, so-and-so is making you know, twice as much as you, but if you don't know what, how hard that actually is, uh, or a good example is buyers on our merchandising team. So for, from all the other different uh, departments' perspective, uh, it's very easy to see, oh, they get to travel to New York and Europe, and blah, blah, blah. you know, it's just a very cushy job when, you know, yes, that's one of the benefits, travel is one of the benefits, but there's also a lot of stuff that they don't see. And, um, and, and so, so that, that's why, that's an example of something where we're not open or, um, or, or not as open as we, I guess, in theory could be. But in general, it's been, uh, you know, you know I, I think as we grow, the most important attribute for, I, I would say maybe even any organization, is the level of trust that there is within the organization, whether it's with each other or with, uh, you know, quote unquote management. But, uh, and one of the fastest ways to grow trust uh, or to accelerate trust is to be as open and transparent as possible. So, so that sort of, it sort of answers this. Yeah, but it, it's hard to think of a, of a good example. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't actually have a question, just a quick uh, bit of food for thought for you. If you take the word pizzas and you rearrange the letters, you practically get Zappos. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a question for you. Okay. Well, so. Thank you. <laughs> My question is, do you have any suggestions on how to create a cult uh, corporate culture when you have a virtual organization? Um, I, I, th I think similar, similar type of types of things. and. Um, I mean, I would definitely suggest getting people to physically be together at, at you know, whether it's quarterly or I don't know what the right uh, timing is. But for us, we found that, uh, you know, we, w part one of our programs is because we're separated about a thousand people in Kentucky where our warehouse is and a thousand people in Vegas. And we actually have basically the equivalent of an exchange program where people from Kentucky come to Vegas for a week and, and vice versa. And once, what we found basically is once you have, can establish kind of that person, personal connection as a base, then uh, a lot of the other stuff is much easier. Uh, and the, we, when we do new manager orientations, we actually encourage new managers to spend 10 to 20% of the time outside the office uh, hanging out with their team or people they're gonna work with, whether it's a happy hour or hiking or bowling or whatever. We don't really care what it is, but more that it's not, uh, doesn't feel like work. And when we first suggest this, a lot of the new managers say, okay, that sounds great, but it doesn't really feel like work and there's a lot of stuff to get done. And you know, how am I gonna make time for this? But then we ask the managers that have done it, how much more productive is your team? How much more efficient is your team? Because there's higher levels of trust. Communication is better. Uh, people are willing to do favors for each other because they're doing favors for friends, not just coworkers. And the answers we get back range anywhere from 20% to 100% more productive. So kind of worst case scenario, break even. And so uh, one of my suggestions would be, even though you know, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis it's virtual, just st still try to do something where people are uh, get to know each other on a personal level. And, I and in general, what we found is actually travel uh, is a great way for people to really develop those more personal relationships because when you're forced to be around someone 24-7, uh, you get to really know them. What advice would you give when you've inherited a team, some of whom don't fit the culture, and firing is not an option? Uh, leave the 
organization. Um, but that, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I mean, if firing isn't an option, then I think that's pretty, pretty tough. And, and, uh, and really that's, that's kind of the whole point is you need to come up with values that you're willing to hire and, and fire based on. And so I don't know exactly what your organization is. You know, I, I know that, you know, in government or maybe in academics, it's probably harder to fire people than in, in a corporation. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that. Yeah, can you talk about the experiences and uh, uh, personal and of others on your team that influenced uh, the culture that you've developed and your thoughts on, on the culture? Uh, yeah, it's basically everyone. Um, and I know that kind of sounds a little bit like a cop-out answer, but I'm not trying to, like, I don't view my job as trying to come up with, uh, you know, the next great idea that's going to help our culture. My, my job is more about, well, here, here's an analogy I, uh, I like to use sometimes. Like, imagine a greenhouse where, uh, you know, there's different plants in it, and if those plants are analogous to employees, in a lot of corporations, the CEO might be the tallest, strongest plant that all the other plants aspire to be, and and you know, and it gives direction to. Whereas, and I don't view myself as having that role. I view my role as being uh, more like the architect that designs the greenhouse that allows plants to flourish and grow into whatever they're going to become. And uh, you know, all that is already with them. It's more just about creating the right environment. And so for us, we have 2,000 employees and. Even if I came up with one great idea every single day, that's still 365 days, 365 ideas a year. Whereas with 2,000 employees, if every employee came up with just one idea a year, that's still way more ideas than, and, and they're going to come up with more than that, that, that's still way more ideas than I could come up with my own. And so really it's about, and, and the, the other thing is we, as we grow bigger, not only do we want not want our culture to go downhill, but we actually want it to scale and get stronger and stronger. And the only way that is poss possibly going to happen is if every employee views as part of his or her job uh, actual responsibility for the culture. And that's w one of the reasons why we actually don't have a culture committee, because that kind of takes away the responsibility from everyone else if there's a committee that's in, in charge of culture. And we really let em employees know this is your culture and we need everyone's uh, everyone's help on it. And another analogy I would use is um, like it meant, like on the Discovery Channel, you know how sometimes you see uh, a flock of 50,000 birds flying over the Serengeti and you take a step back and it looks like the whole flock is a single organism. Well, there's actually no you know, bird that's kind of the leading the whole flock the entire time. Uh, instead, the birds actually function by very simple rules like stay so many feet or inches from the bird on the right, stay so many inches from the bird on the left, and, and so on. But with these very basic rules, it actually allows uh, flocking behavior to scale. So whether it's 50 birds flying as a flock or 50,000 birds flying as a flock, the same basic rules allows you know, the 50,000 to appear to move in unison and as a single, almost like a single organism. And so I think the now, and that's because all the birds have the same, essentially the same DNA. And so I think the equivalent or the analogous thing for culture in a corporation is ha having all the employees have um, these personal values that match our corporate values. And then if every employee just acts consistently with their own personal values that match the corporate values and everyone understands the long-term vision of the com company, that combination just enables us to scale and grow as an organization without having our culture going downhill and then if every employee views as part of their job description, and we actually have them sign something part of where they say part of their job description is not only living up to our core values, but inspiring the core values in others, that's what will uh, allow us to grow. And so as I will go through the office, there's tons of stuff that uh, I didn't know about, but just suddenly, you know, it's just employees coming up with ideas, and we try to really encourage employees, if they're passionate about something, just run with it. And uh, we try to, even if it's not part of your job description, even if it's not, has nothing to do with your department, uh, and chances are we're of the size now where if you actually are passionate about something, you can find at least two or three other employees that 
will follow, follow you if, if you do it. And we try to really create an environment where, of, where it's more uh, ask forgiveness than permission. So, so I, I promised Tony I'd give him a little oh, bit uh, of time at the end to make some cl closing remarks. So this would be the last question. I apologize for all those of you who wanted to ask questions. Here's the last question. Hello, what's the closest you ever personally got to being cynical other than talking to audiences like this? <laughs> um, and how did you overcome that? Uh, well, I think at my previous company, I just gave up and, 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 and sold the company and, and then left. And so uh, and I guess the, the lucky thing in that scenario was it worked out well financially for me. And so I basically went into whatever I was doing with the thought of what would I do if it, if it weren't for the money. And for me, it was, well, I want to, if I'm going to quote unquote work, then I'm going to, I want to work with people that I would choose to be around even if we weren't working together. And so th I think that's kind of initially what, what, um, what, what drove the culture. Um, and I think actually it's probably more the the opposite, like throughout all our the history of, of Zappos, there's always been naysayers of something. You know, in the beginning it was you can't sell shoes online; people have to try shoes on. And then it's you can't build a brand around customer service, especially if you're an internet company, and then and, and so on. And so I think just over time we've learned that in some ways, being told that it's not possible or can't be done actually uh, ends up inspiring and motivating us more. Okay, Tony, turn it back over to you. Okay. Um, so going back to this uh, question, which I actually want all of you to think about, what is your goal in life? And, uh, and actually would encourage you to actually think about what your own personal goal in life is. And for me, it's interesting because I ask a lot of different people this question. And when I ask different people this question, I'll get different responses. Some people say, uh, like in an entrepreneur conference, they'll say, I want to grow a company. Some people might say, I want to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Uh, and then I ask them why. And then, so whatever you thought of your own goal in life is, I would encourage you to ask yourself why. And then people will come up with different answers, retire early, find a soulmate, and so on. And then ask why again. And, and so whatever you came up with would encourage you to think why again. And then people will come up with a separate center so I can spend more time with family, so I can get married. Uh, and then ask why again. And what's interesting is that if you ask yourself why enough times, almost everyone actually ends up with the same answer. And it's that they believe that whatever their goal in life is, if they pursue it, if they achieve it, that it's going to ultimately make them happier. So two or three years ago, having nothing at all to do with Zappos, just kind of as a side hobby almost, I started reading these books and articles about this uh, new field of research that was called about the science of happiness. The official name is positive psychology, but it's based on actual scientific research that's been done. So I'm not talking about, you know, go to the self-help section of a bookstore and read books that say think positive and you'll be happy, but actual research that's been done. And as I started reading about it, one of the consistent things that I learned from the research was that people are very bad at predicting what will actually make them happy in the long run. Most people think, oh, once I get this, or, then I'll be happy. Once I achieve this, then I'll be happy. Uh, when the research shows that's just not true. Uh, look at lottery winners, studies of lottery winners right before winning the lottery, and then look at their happiness level a year later, and a year later it's the same or maybe even a little bit lower than it was uh, before they won the lottery. And this field of research actually didn't exist prior to 1998. Prior to 1998, most of psychology was about looking at people that had something wrong with them and trying to figure out how to make people more normal. But almost nobody bothered to study how to take normal people and make them happier. So I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And it, you know, not only was I interested in it just out of personal curiosity, but then as I learned that, oh, you know, Zappos is about trying to make customers happier, and Zappos is about trying to make employees happier. But if people are bad at predicting what will make them happier, you can't just ask customers or employees what should we do as a company or as an employer? Because the answers you get back, what the research has shown, will a lot of times be just completely wrong. 
And you know, there's a science behind a lot of the stuff that we do at Zappos in terms of looking at customer acquisition metrics, repeat customer behavior, and so on. And I don't know what the right percentage is, but if the ultimate goal is happiness, what if you just spent some percentage of your time just reading up on the research that's already been done on the science of happiness? How much happier could you be, and how could that help your brand or your business? And you know, there's so many people that go through life trying to get to that final destination of happiness. They'll spend decades trying to get there, and a lot of them, sadly, don't get there. And a lot of the ones that do eventually get there find out that it's very short-lived and uh, not exactly what they were hoping for. What if by reading up a little bit about the research that's been done on the science of happiness, you could kind of take a shortcut or get there faster and instead of doing a lot of the stuff in between? So I just wanted to share, uh, in wrapping up, a few different frameworks of happiness that I thought were the most interesting and as I was reading through the, the uh, different books and articles. And the first framework is that happiness is really just about four things. Perceived control, perceived progress, connectedness, meaning the number and depth of your relationships, and being part of something bigger than yourself. And what I found really interesting is not only can you apply this to your own life, but we, we ended up applying a lot of these concepts to Zappos as well. You know, connectedness, for example, is basic number and depth of your relationships. That basically translates into company culture. And from a business perspective uh, or profitability perspective, you know, there's plenty of studies that show a correlation between employee engagement and employee productivity. And one of the best predictors of employee engagement is whether they have a best friend at work or the number of friends that they have at work. Uh, for perceived progress, we used to hire people in our merchandising department at entry level, and then we'd give them all the training and certification and so on, and then 18 months after that, they'd get a promotion, and they'd get additionally trained and certified, and then 18 months after that, they'd become a buyer at Zappos, which is kind of a big thing at, at Zappos. So three years to become a buyer from entry level. Well, we changed it a few, months, a few years ago so that instead of a promotion every 18 months, we gave them smaller promotions every six months. They still had to go through the exact same training, and they still took three years to become a buyer, but we found that employees were suddenly a lot happier, and this cost the company nothing to, to implement. So another uh, framework is Maslow's Hierarchy. There's a book called Peak, P-E-A-K, by Chip Conley, where he actually takes Maslow's Hierarchy and condenses it down to three levels and applies it to customers and employees and investors. And so as an example, for customers, it's do customers think of their work as a job? or career or calling. And our whole goal at Zappos is to move employees up that pyramid because we still want them to be employees of Zappos 10 years from now. And the only way an employee is going to be at Zappos or any company for 10 years is if they feel like they're continuing to grow both personally and professionally. And so that's why we invest so much in employee uh, education and mentorship and, and growth both on the personal and professional side. And then the last framework I want to share is about three different types of happiness, pleasure, engagement, and meaning. The first, part, first type of happiness I like to call the rock star type of happiness because it's all about chasing that next high. And it's great as long as you can sustain it. The problem is it's very hard to sustain unless you're basically a rock star. And <laughs> what the research has shown is that as soon as the source of stimuli goes away, your happiness level just plummets and drops right back down to wherever it was before. So it's the shortest lasting out of these three types of happiness. The second type is called flow, and there's a book by the same name, and it's all about those, and we've all experienced this, it's about those moments when you're so into whatever you're doing. For some people it might be painting, for other people it might be running, but you're so engaged that time just flies. Three hours pass, but it seems like it's only been 20 minutes. And for professional athletes, it's about when peak performance meets peak engagement. They refer to it as being in the zone. And other attributes associated with it are that you lose a sense of self-consciousness or even self. And uh, kind of the strategy here is notice when it happens, because it happens to all of us. And when it does happen, you know, think about, OK, what is it that you can change about either your environment or your job or where you live or uh, who you hang out with? Uh, who, who you're friends with, to try to have these type moments of flow happen more often, more frequently. And what the research has shown is this is the second longest lasting type of happiness. And the third type is about being part of something bigger than yourself. So for some, for some people, this might mean volunteering for your favorite charity, for example. And what the research has shown is that this is actually the longest lasting type of happiness. 
So what I find really interesting is most people go through life trying to chase after the first type of happiness, thinking, okay, once I can sustain that, then I'll worry about the second type, and then if I ever get around to it, I'll worry about the third type, when trying to sustain the first one is basically impossible. When based on the research data, the proper strategy is figure out the third type of happiness first, and then layer on top of that the second type, and then any time you experience the first type of happiness, that's just kind of icing on the cake. So some recommended books, and um, uh, I'll, for a copy of this presentation, just email me, Tony, at deliveringhappinessbook.com. Make sure to include the uh, book at the end of the email address. For a copy of this presentation, also the culture book I talked about earlier, happy to send out for free. It's a physical book, so we'll need your physical mailing address. Uh, next time you're in Vegas, take a tour. Uh, just, you can just sign up at tours.zappos.com. We give tours several times a day, Monday through Thursdays. And you know, the subtitle of my book is A Path to Profits, Passion, and Purpose, because what the research has shown is that you need all three in order to build a long-term growing sustainable business. And so too many companies in corporate America focus on just the profits, which, and they forget about the passion and the purpose, which actually ends up preventing them from making more profits in the long run. And then I had this weird, uh, I don't know if you want to call it an aha moment, or it was almost like a sign as I was reading uh, about the science of happiness over the past couple of years, where happiness is about being able to combine pleasure, passion, and purpose. So in a weird way, it's, it's almost as if there's a sign like indicating that happiness as a business model is, is uh, you know, it's, it, like now, now is the time. And I think we're actually just at the beginning of a very special time, because maybe 50 years ago, businesses felt like they had to choose between maximizing profits or making customers happy or making employees happy. But our belief is that a company's culture and a company's brand are really just two sides of the same coin. And the brand is just a lagging indicator of the culture. And if you think about the airline industry, for example, you ask most people, what do they think of the airline industry? They'll talk about apathetic employees, bad customer service, and so on. And like it or not, that is the brand of the industry as a whole, even though no airline set out for that to be their brand. But I think we're at the beginning of a very special time where because information travels so quickly now, whether it's through blogs or Twitter or Facebook and so on, that that lag between a company's brand and a company's culture is becoming less and less. And we can actually use happiness as a business model, make customers happy, make employees happy, and have that drive business profits and growth. So just want to leave you guys with thinking about what percent of your time do you want to spend learning, reading up a little bit about the science of happiness, and how can that help your business, your brand, and yourself personally? And if the research shows that businesses that have a higher purpose actually end up making more profits in the long run, and if the research shows that if people that have a sense of a higher purpose or greater purpose are actually happier, you know, what is your own organization's higher purpose and what is your own personal higher purpose? And if through this you've been inspired to focus more on customer service to make customers happier, or you've been inspired to focus more on company culture to make employees happier, or you've been inspired to just read up a little bit on the whole science of happiness to make yourself happier. If any of those things have happened, then I'll have done my part in helping us achieve our higher purpose, which is all about delivering happiness to the world. Thank you very much. Tony, Tony forgot the fourth happiness, which is having him speak at the Milken Institute. <laughs> well, thank you. So we're going to have two lines over here, one for buying the book, and the other is for signing the book. Thank you very much. Hope to see you on October 8th. <laughs>